Good morning. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Why don't you sing with us? Mother's Day. Uh, I just want to take a moment to think about and appreciate how much our moms really mean to us. Um, I don't know about you, but my mom was always there to comfort me. And I look at my wife and our daughter and the special bond and relationship they share and how Kayla always seems to be able to comfort Rowan. Uh, well, this event actually has its roots in God. And uh, this morning, I want to share that passage. It comes out of 2 Corinthians Verses 3 and 4. Let's read this together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We see here that God provides us with comfort, and in turn, he encourages us to comfort those around us. So moms, today we honor you. Thank you so much for comforting us, for putting up with us, and for loving us. And church, let's continue to uh, sing with our hearts directed with gratitude toward God. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh is free indeed I'm a child of God yes I am free last 
Christ, he has ransomed me, his grace from the sea. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free. Grace Church. Thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. I have one announcement for us, and that is on Wednesday, May 20th at 7 p.m., we're going to have another elder-led prayer. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, it's a chance for us as a church to gather together and pray for the needs of our community and those throughout the world at this time. If you'd like to sign up as an individual or as a family, you can do that by emailing us at connect at gracechurchinfo.net. We're going to read the Bible together. Uh, we're going to read from Romans chapter 8. So I'd really encourage you to grab a Bible at home and open up and read along with us. This is one of the most significant promises that we have in the New Testament. And so read along with us starting uh, in chapter 8, verse 31. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously offer us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God and Father, we come to you in great awe of the truth of this passage, that through you, you have conquered these things. 
and that in you that we too are more than conquerors. God, would you open our hearts to receive this truth this morning, and would you give Paul the words to speak to us uh, these things from your word? Would your spirit speak through him to us that we might be changed uh, because of it? Uh, Please bless our church this morning as we worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. When I was about eight years old, my parents let me get my very first pet. It was a hermit crab. And I was the only kid at school who had one. All the other kids had dogs or cats or hamsters, but I had a crab. But it wasn't long before I figured out why it was that none of the other kids wanted a hermit crab. It turns out that there's a reason that they call hermit crabs hermit crabs and not super fun crabs. And the reason is because hermit crabs are not super fun. They're hermits. All they do is just sit around in their shells all day thinking about who knows what, and they're only active for about two minutes usually in the middle of the night when they sneak out to take a sip of water. As an eight-year-old, I was stuck with the crab. It wasn't what I wanted, but it was what I had. And so I remember I just had to make the most of it. And I say all of that because there's been times in my life when I've wondered if God feels towards me the same way that I felt towards my crab. Like God is just stuck with me. I'm not what he really wants, but he's just going to have to make the most of it. And I've talked to plenty of Christians who have told me that sometimes they wonder the same thing. There's a funny thing that starts to happen for us as we grow more and more mature in Christ, and that is that we become more aware of how serious our flaws are, And it can sometimes become harder and harder to believe that that God's love for us is truly heartfelt. It, It can become tempting to think that, if anything, God just kind of tolerates us. That, that he's made promises to us, yes, that he has to fulfill, but that he couldn't possibly fulfill them with any real sense of joy and delight. As if God loving us is just a, a, a job that he signed up for without realizing what it was that he was getting into. Do you ever feel that way? Well, I want to explore today for a few minutes the, the love of God. I, I want to think about what he says is true about the way that he feels for his children. And we're going to spend a few minutes looking at what he says at the end of the book of Romans chapter 8. But I I wanna start with a caution before we dive into Romans chapter 8. And that is to say that some of us who hear these words this morning are going to have a hard time believing that this could be true. So before we go there, I just want to read to you a couple of things that God says are true about himself before we dive in. First, I want to read from Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, which says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent, Has he said and he will not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says this, Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. 
And Hebrews 6, 18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. Now, people sometimes wonder if there's anything that God cannot do. And the answer to that is yes, he cannot lie. God doesn't have the capacity to lie. He can't stretch the truth. And and that's because just like any other sin, it, it just isn't in his nature. And what that means is that we can trust that the things that God says are exactly how he feels. And I wanted to say that to prepare us because what God says about his love in this passage is absolutely extraordinary. The Jesus Storybook Bible correctly describes the love of God as a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And we've got to begin by trusting that God could never lie because otherwise we could never believe that the things he says in Romans chapter eight could possibly be true. So with that as an introduction, let's take a look at this tremendous passage. Paul begins in verse 31 with a question. He says, what shall we say to these things? So we know that what Paul is going to do here is he's going to respond to some things that he's already said. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what are those things? What's he talking about here? So what I want to do is just briefly give you a thumbnail sketch of the book of Romans. Paul begins the book of Romans in chapters 1 through 3 with a very persuasive explanation of the need of every person for the grace of God. Paul argues very effectively that there is no one, neither Jew nor Gentile, who is righteous before God because none of us can possibly do those things which God requires. So instead, Paul says, we all stand condemned before God under the guilt of our sin. But at the end of chapter 3, we are told that God has made a provision for our salvation, not through any work that we could do on our own, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we learn in chapter 4 that just as Abraham uh, had faith and believed God and that this faith was credited to him as righteousness, Paul argues that when we too believe in Christ by faith, we are gifted with that very same righteousness that Abraham received. Now, in the next section of the book, which is chapters 5 through 8, we are are shown how this absolutely transforms our lives. Uh, In chapter 5, we're told that faith in Jesus frees us from the wrath of God so that we can stand before him in an atmosphere of complete peace. In chapter 6, we see how Jesus frees us from being slaves to sin so that instead we are alive to God and we can serve him with joy. In chapter 7, we're shown how Christ releases us from the power of the law. And then in chapter 8, which is perhaps the high point of the whole New Testament, Paul absolutely celebrates the fact that, again, Thanks to what Jesus has done for us, we are free even from death itself. And he describes the glorious future that awaits all those who have believed in him. Now, in the book of Romans, the gospel is on display like a fireworks show. And and Paul himself, even as he writes the book, you, you can tell he's absolutely dazzled by all of it. And he makes it crystal clear that everything that we have in regard to salvation and eternal life, we only have God to thank for. What an outstanding gift these things are. And so Paul, in the passage that we get to, says, well, what should we say to all of these things? How should we think about all of this? What do these things tell us about God? 
And then what he does is he answers his own question. Let's look at verse 31. He says, what then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So the first thing that this tells us is, is that if all of this is true, if, if God would do all of this for us, then it ought to be glaringly obvious that God is neither neutral or emotionless towards us. That he cannot be the cold, stern father that some of us imagine him to be, or, or the frowning cosmic police officer that so many of us envision. If God would give us all of this, Paul reasons, then he's got to be on our side. God must be for us. And if God has the power to do everything that Romans chapter 1 through 8 describes, then that means that nothing can stand against us. If God is for us, nothing can be against us. Now, Paul could have ended his thought right there. That would have been enough. Romans chapter 1 through 8 proves that point. But if, just in case, the first eight chapters of the book of Romans don't convince us that God really is for us, what Paul goes on to do is he goes on to give four more evidences that this must be true. And the way that he does this is by using four rhetorical questions. The first of which is in the very next verse, verse 32. So if you're a Christian this morning who is tempted to sometimes feel like God couldn't possibly really be for you, then what Paul is about to do is give you some evidence to the contrary. Here's his first argument. Proof number one, he says, is this. Look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now what Paul is doing here is he's making an argument that goes from greater to lesser. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say that Albert Einstein's wife were to say to him, Honey, you developed the theory of relativity and are the greatest physicist who has ever lived. But don't you think you could remember to pick up your socks off the bathroom floor? What she's just done there is she's made an argument from greater to lesser. She's suggested that if he can accomplish something so big, like developing the theory of relativity, that it should be no problem for him at all to accomplish something so much smaller, like picking his socks up off the floor. That's the argument from greater to lesser. Now, Paul's argument is similar, and it goes like this. If God would do something so great for us in not sparing his own son, but giving him up for us all, then he says, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. The, the greatest evidence, Paul argues, of the tremendous depth of God's love for sinners is the cross, where God gave up for us the most valuable thing that he has, his son. Anything else that God might have sacrificed for us could not even come as nearly as close as the cost in giving us Jesus. Think about this for just a second. If God had surrendered the entire universe for us instead of Jesus, it still would have paled in comparison because God could create a whole nother universe in the blink of an eye. It wouldn't have cost him a thing. But at the cross, God the Father gave up the one person who could not be uh, replaced. 
And in, in doing so, God the Father had to endure turning his face away as his beloved son was murdered. And what Paul says is if God would willingly allow that, if God would do something so big as not to spare his only son, he says, how will he not graciously give us all things? If God would, would do that, how will he not meet our every need and fulfill our every promise? If he's already given us Jesus, whose value is infinite, Paul says, why wouldn't he give us everything else too? God already accomplished the hard part at the cross, and the rest of the story to him is just the details. You know, if it's true that you personally don't really matter that much to God, and if you don't think that his love for you is truly and fully genuine, or to use Paul's words, if you don't believe that God in his heart is truly for you, then Paul asks the question, why on earth would he send Jesus to die for you? And if he loved you enough to give up Jesus for you, why would that love ever stop? If he gave you Jesus, Paul says, why would there be anything else that he would hold back? No. God is for us, he says. God is all in. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, a person may still have their doubts after hearing that first evidence, I suppose. So, Paul gives a second evidence as well in verse 33. He says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now, the second piece of evidence that God is for us is that, thanks to what Jesus has done, nobody can bring a charge against us. Nobody can ever say that all of the promises that you have received in Christ are not yours to claim. Now, there are certainly people who believe that you're not worthy of them. Maybe the kid at school who hates your guts, or the ex-girlfriend or boyfriend whose heart you broke a few years ago, or any number of people that you might have mistreated or lied to or betrayed in your lifetime. They could all claim that you're not worthy of these things. Or even worse, Satan himself could say that you aren't worthy. He certainly could cite example after example of all the ways that you've broken God's commandments over and over again. Or think about this. God himself could do the same thing. And God knows every one of your bad habits and your impure thoughts and the secret attitudes of your heart. Think about all the charges that God could bring against you. But what this verse says is that since God is for us in the gospel, not a single one of those charges can stick because Paul says right here, it is God who justifies. Now, that word is such an important one in the Bible. The word justify means to declare righteous. And we are told that at the moment that we trust Christ through faith, we are declared by God to be righteous. In fact, we are given the righteousness of Christ. And so just like Abraham, the one who is declared righteous is set completely free from the guilt of their sins. Now, since through faith in Christ, God has already declared his child to be righteous, that means that no one ever, anywhere, anyhow, no matter who they are, 
No person, no power, not Satan or even God himself can ever bring a charge against that person. Their case is closed. Their sin is resolved and all charges against them are dropped. If you're a Christian, at your death, when the Lord takes your hand and he welcomes you into your new home forever in his paradise, as he does that, if any voice at all should cry out, don't do it, don't let him in, she doesn't deserve it, she's not worthy. What Paul is saying here is that those voices will have absolutely no effect. Because it's not that person who justifies us. It is God who justifies. And Paul says, and who will bring any charge against God's elect? God is for us, Paul says. So who can be against us? Not only that, but Paul gives a third piece of evidence that God certainly must be for us. In verse 34, he says, Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now this uh, piece of evidence is tightly connected to the last one. Not only can no one bring a charge against God's children, but as a byproduct of that, Paul says, now nobody can condemn them either. If every charge against you is dropped, then from head to toe and, and everything in between, you are a person who is absolutely free. And Paul says, the reason we have this freedom is Jesus. He says, because first Jesus died, and then Jesus rose again, and then he tells us exactly what Jesus is doing right now. He is interceding for us. In front of who? God the Father, where he sits at his right hand. So what this means is that, again, if anyone comes before God to bring charges against us and to suggest that we ought to be condemned for our sin, Jesus is right there to intercept those charges. And his intercession on our behalf means that it's like he reminds the Father, I know that this child of yours has sinned against you. I know that the charges that are being brought are true and that they do deserve to be condemned. But remember the cross, Jesus says. Remember that I spilled my blood for them. Remember that all of their debt has been paid. Remember that their justification has already been declared. And Jesus says on our behalf, you cannot condemn them. For the condemnation that they deserve, I have already taken upon myself at the cross. What Jesus' intercession on our behalf proves, Paul says, is that God must be for us. And not only that, but it proves that he's for us forever, that he would never send his children away, that we are so incredibly secure in Christ. I mean, think about this for, for just a second, that if Satan were to come before the throne of God and accuse you personally before the Father, we are told here that Jesus himself would be right there to vouch for you. What an incredible truth. And Paul says, it's another evidence that God is for us and that no one in light of that can be against us. 
But if a person is not finally convinced by those three arguments, Paul leaves one last evidence for the end. And this is like his mic drop. Listen to the words of verses 35 through 39. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as secure as you are from being charged or condemned, by anyone or anything, Paul says, so secure are you in the love of Christ. Your advocate, Jesus, who, who intercedes for you before the throne of God is not like some fresh out of law school attorney who has been assigned to your case and stuck with you because he couldn't get a better job. Your advocate, is your very Savior himself, Paul says, who loves you with the kind of love that nothing in the universe can stop. Now, there are all kinds of things in life that can make us feel like Christ's love for us falls short. And Paul quotes a psalm here that reminds us that we will face significant trials of, of different kinds in life. He says, sometimes we'll feel like we are being killed all day long, like, like we are sheep that are being sent to the slaughter. And, and he lists some of the trials that would make us feel that way. Tribulation and distress and persecution and, and famine and nakedness and danger and sword. All of those things are some of the worst experiences that a person can have in life. But Paul says that not even in these things is the love of Christ stopped. He, he says to the contrary, even in these experiences of life, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Do you know what a conqueror is? A, a conqueror is a victor. It's the person who wins. And Paul is saying that even though sometimes life might get incredibly ugly, in the end, he says, we will still have the victory through the one who loved us, that we are more than conquerors. And then, as if that's not enough, Paul keeps going. In this passage, it's kind of like he, he can't uh, stop. He, he says, it's not just the suffering in life that cannot derail the love of Christ for a person, but neither can death or life itself. He, he says angels can't do it either, even though they're the most powerful created beings. And what about time? Uh, certainly Christ's love would have to grow lukewarm over time, right? Paul says, no, in both the present and in the things to come, his love never runs cold. And he says, there is no power that can stand against it. There is no height or depth that can outdistance the love of Christ. There is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what I want us to see this morning is that God himself leaves absolutely no wiggle room whatsoever in regard to the total exhaustiveness of his love. 
There is nothing in all the universe that can drive even a sliver between you and the love that radiates out of the heart of Christ. God's love is not a love of toleration. God's love is a love of joy and delight. And Paul tells us that there is nothing in life that can possibly stop it. Living through a pandemic can't stop it. Cancer can't stop it. Depression can't stop it. A tragedy of any kind can't stop it. And even our struggle to believe that God's love could actually be this good, that can't stop it either. You know, just because sometimes it's hard to believe that God loves us like this, that it doesn't make it any less true. And when we look at ourselves and our own weaknesses and, and liabilities, and we think to ourselves, I, I, I don't deserve this kind of love, so God must not offer it. What that's called is self-justification. We're trying to justify the reason that God ought to love us. But this passage tells us that it is God who justifies, not us. God's love is a love that is not based on you. It's a love that's based on him. And so on those days when you don't feel the love of Christ, I just want to encourage you, don't trust those feelings. Don't measure God's love by your own standards. Measure God's love by what he says. And remember verses like Hebrews 6, 18, that it is impossible for God to lie. You know, if you believe that God's love for you is motivated simply out of a sense of his own duty and drudgery, then your experience of the Christian life will always be deficient and living for God will feel to you in return like a duty and a drudgery. But if you trust that God's love for you is motivated not by your own deservedness, but by his spectacular heart, which is so full of joy and delight, then what will happen is that you will be so much more motivated by that same kind of joy and delight. It's the love of God that, that fills up the tank of our love for him and for other people. And I hope that this passage gives you the confidence to believe that it really is true, that you are loved with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. What then shall we say about these things? that if God is for us, who can be against us? What a truth. Let's pray. Father, as uh, someone once said, it is so true that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dare believe. And yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we could ever dare hope. We want to thank you this morning for not sparing your son, but for giving him up for us that our sins might be forgiven, that we could be declared the most wonderful thing in the world, justified, righteous in your sight, not out of our own action or obedience, but out of the gift that you gave us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that as this passage tells us that in light of this, no charge can ever be brought against us. We thank you that it means that we can never be condemned. We thank you that no tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or 
nakedness or danger, you tell us. Neither life or death or angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or height or depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Father, would you help us please to believe that this morning and to trust that. Father, may that truth, that quality of love make us want to worship you and serve you forever. Would you please grow our love for you Father, I know that there are many who are struggling right now. All of us are in many ways. Thank you that your love is meant to break through that fog. And so I pray that you would give us the kind of hearts that long to know that love more. Hearts that pursue it. Hearts that seek to trust that that love could be true in faith. And I pray that by your spirit, your love would transform us so that more and more we can love like you. Father, we thank you for this tremendous passage and pray that you would help it to deeply sink into our hearts in the way that we need. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
we give our gifts now as we continue to worship. This time of giving is our opportunity to respond in gratitude to the great love and grace and mercy that God so freely and willingly gave us through his son, Jesus Christ. And by our giving, we put our beliefs, our trust in God into action. We have the privilege of maintaining the Lord's name through this body of believers and by spreading the truth of the gospel throughout the world in the unique ways that God has called us to do that here at Grace. You can give in three different ways. You can give online, you can give by text, or you can still mail a check to the church. Will you please join me in praying for the offering? Father, we thank you for the indescribable gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sacrifice that was to you, the willingness that you uh, displayed for us to give without reservation, uh, your son on our behalf. And we thank you for that. And we want to respond in gratitude. So will you teach us how to do that? Will you grow in us hearts that more and more um, move toward generosity and gratitude? Father, we thank you for the privilege of maintaining this body of believers and your name in our community. And we also thank you for the privilege that you have given us uniquely to, to help the, the churches that you have established in Albania and Kosovo and Macedonia for the glory of your name. We pray, Father, that the gospel would prosper, that your word would not return void, and that your uh, name would be made fame, famous uh, through these gifts. For your glory and in your name we pray. Amen. Well, today is Mother's Day, and I sure wish that we were all together eating the chocolates that we traditionally give out today. Because we all know the way to a woman's heart is through chocolate, right? Unfortunately, we aren't able to do that this year. But the great news is we are able to bring the women of our church family before the Lord. So will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the gift of motherhood, and we thank you that through it we are able to experience in tangible ways parts of your character through their nurturing, through their loving kindness and compassion, tenderness, gentleness, and caring. We thank you for uh, that display of your character through uh, our moms. We pray, Father, for those women who are moms that you would give them strength and courage every day to face whatever that day brings as they raise their children. Would you be their source of wisdom and counsel through your spirit? Would you give them endurance and perseverance as some days are hard and uh, help them to enjoy the laughter and the joy of the good days? And Father, we know that this day is also one that is very difficult for some women because they have lost their moms or they um, are unable to have children or they desire greatly to have children but they they aren't married yet and so father for anyone who is experiencing sorrow on this day would you be their source of comfort and tenderness and compassion draw them close to yourself and may they feel your presence and your peace in their heartache and father we um, pray for the young girls that you have blessed us with in our congregation and we pray that we would be committed to raising up another generation of women who know who you are and um, will grow in your character and will be women that would bring great glory to you and so we thank you for this gift father we ask that you would bless all the women in our church and that we would bring you glory in your name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.